This episode is brought to you by Old Olandus Wild Snake. The only wild snake made from the rare Ash Flats Cobra. You won't find any synthahol in our brew. Only the finest in distilled liquor. So when you go to the bar, tell them you want Old Olandus. The best in Hive Primus. Dome Runners TV. Your guide to the Underhive. And beyond. Hey there, scabby scummers and gangers. Crimson Oracle here with another episode of Dome Runners TV. And today I want to talk about kind of a thought experiment, sort of a, you know, exploration of, of some concepts surrounding the probing question of what would Warhammer look like without Games Workshop? Now, there's a chance that when you clicked on this link, it was under a slightly sensationalist headline like, Would Warhammer exist under communism? Or, This is the future that leftists want for Warhammer 40k. I just wanted to catch people's eyes because I think this is an important topic. The intention of this video is to look at Games Workshop as it currently exists, this corporation, um, and why it is uh, able to sort of leverage its market position in order to uh, extract as much money out of us as possible, and then to kind of look at how Warhammer can be pursued in other models that would still allow it to exist. Um, and this all kind of goes back to a conversation that I saw on, uh, I think, a Facebook comment thread the other day. <laughs> they thought that Warhammer should cost whatever Games Workshop wants uh, because Warhammer would not exist under communism uh, in the USSR. Uh, now, of course, the topic of whether the USSR was a communist economy is its own whole thing. Uh, a lot of Americans have weird ideas about uh, the the Soviet economy. So the idea that this was some sort of post-capitalism economy is just very silly. And uh, yeah, I mean, of course, games were created in in uh, the USSR. Uh, you know, Tetris famously was created by uh, a a student uh, who was working at a, a software firm in, uh, in in the USSR, and. Uh, <laughs> It's especially silly to me because I think games are such a uh, enduring part of human history and capitalism exists for just this just tiny amount of time. And so I wanted to kind of look at what the game can become if you didn't have corporate GW at the center. Uh, now, this is a number of different scenarios that we're going to look at um, that kind of give us an idea of uh, what we're going to, you know, uh, potentially see down the road. And, and, and this is a nice thought experiment in general because part of the challenge of challenging this sort of, you know, capitalist structure where we are completely held hostage by the whims of these big corporations that control all of our prices and whose interest is to the shareholder, not to the customer, uh, then we have to find ourselves considering that there might be alternatives. There's other options and there's ways to change things. And so each of these scenarios will cover a different concept uh, and then we'll kind of wrap it up at the end. So with that, let's do a little bit of background first. If you like our content, don't forget to like and subscribe. And for as little as $2 a month, you can become a patron and help support the show. Part 1. The Network Effect so the first thing I want to talk about is the idea of the network effect. The thing that makes Warhammer so special in the world of tabletop gaming is that you can reliably walk into pretty much any game store, even a lot of comic shops and with such uh, across the country, across the world even, and find someone who has a Warhammer army that they would like to play with. And, and you can get games because of that. Now, uh, in economic terms, the, a network effect is any effect where the number of people purchasing a product increases the value of the product. So for a game, obviously, most games, uh, particularly multiplayer games, network effects are fairly obvious. The more people who are participating, the more game there is available, the more people who want to join, etc. So the value goes up as people engage with the product now warhammer is far and away the largest 
of the war games out there. Uh, there used to be a lot of popular historical games, for example, before Warhammer. Uh, and over time, those have sort of fallen by the wayside because they lost their sort of network effect. It used to be, back in the day, that those people were the default. You could play historical games reliably, but there wasn't really as much of a you know, market or, or a breadth of uh, fantasy or, or sci-fi related games. But with the rise of Games Workshop in the 80s, there was a major sea change. Uh, and they became something of a default. And a lot of that was down to having quality multi-part plastics and the sort of freedom and flexibility of their, you know, the 40K universe, perhaps more so than Warhammer Fantasy Battle, uh, which is a little bit less uh, flexible. As a result, Games Workshop took off. And that was huge for the hobby because it, due to economies of scale, created, you know, products that were instead of these sort of lead cast models, you had, you know, large quantity production, plastic, injection molded, all that stuff. And it was a game changer. Uh, and in time, a lot of companies would kind of rise up to sort of exist in that marketplace in addition to or in competition with Games Workshop. So, you know, you have Corvus Belly doing Infinity. You have uh, War Machine and Hordes. Uh, you have Malifaux from Weird. You know, th there's countless. There's Bolt Action. There's so many things uh, that over the years have sort of tried to catch on and, and sort of challenge that hegemony that Games Workshop has. Um, and Games Workshop has always sort of won out. And part of that is down to the fact they have so many players. Uh, but the company has also had moments where, you know, things were looking kind of not great for them. So, for example, the fantasy uh, game was just not doing well. And eventually they killed it off. And, and that was what led to the creation of Age of Sigmar. And that kind of situation is a bit of a, a risky proposition because... Games Workshop is suddenly surrounded by a lot more competitors who are making products that are on their level. You know, you've got Conquest, which has probably arguably just as good uh, minis as Age of Sigmar um, and doesn't have quite so many. It uh, doesn't have any uh, sort of holdovers from from 15, 20 years ago where, you know, the kit design just wasn't as good and, and models just weren't as, as sort of polished looking. You've got Atomic Mass Games putting out just as good a quality minis as Games Workshop. I mean, the the Marvel Crisis Protocols and the upcoming Shatterpoint models are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I, I have no complaints about these minis. They look incredible. Um, I don't necessarily get into the like superhero side of gaming. Um, I, I like to read comics and such, but uh, I've never really been like a big into uh, to playing modern games. So um, I haven't really been interested in that, but I'm definitely going to check out Shatterpoint when it comes out um, because it's just a beautiful looking game and I, I can't wait to kind of kick the tires on it. Modifius now is getting into the world of plastic injection molding and their stuff for Fallout is absolutely incredible. And so seeing some of that transition over to hard plastics, they should be a little bit more worried than they are, I think. Uh, a lot of people will talk about 3D printing as an alternative. Um, I do think that 3D printing opens up a lot of opportunities for people to sort of get into home manufacturing and, and sort of getting into making masters and, and taking casts and, and doing stuff in resin. But I don't think resin models will ever challenge plastic for dominance just because plastic is such a better material in pretty much every way anyhow so assuming that we want to see warhammer continue i wanted to consider what warhammer could look like without games workshop or without games workshop as we know it because i think that currently the company's strategy is a little bit based around well Let's be honest. Shareholders are what's driving the current decision making about pricing. And the reason is that they want regular dividends. They want those big checks every time Games Workshop announces profits. You know, being a dividend paying stock has a lot of downsides for Games Workshop. Uh, they have to generate a lot of excess profit. Otherwise, the people holding their stock 
don't get paid, and then they consider selling, and that drops the value of the company. Part 2. Capitalist Realism The last thing I want to talk about before we move on to looking at these specific scenarios uh, is the concept of capitalist realism. Now, this is a term coined by the English philosopher Mark Fisher, and it's meant to invoke the idea through reference to socialist realism, the art style, uh, that capitalism creates an environment uh, for people living within it that they cannot conceive of an alternative. It makes capitalism so feel so natural and innate that there is no alternative, and we all just sort of accept the externalities of our economic system. But the truth is that there's a lot of different options for how we can change our economic structure. Capitalism has only existed for a few hundred years out of a hundred thousand or more years of human existence. So what exactly is this thing about capitalism where it just completely imposes itself on us? Uh, that has to do with, first of all, capitalism's ability to subsume within itself all criticisms and make it part of their structure so you know you can sort of see this in action with a company like games workshop where this setting is conceived of as this sort of critique of you know the sort of wealthy class you know lording their power over the masses treating everyone like dirt and like their lives are disposable and and these you know sort of distant elites just sort of dictating how the world works but that is actually you know reflected in the economic structure that we have and you wind up eventually that that sort of creation becomes part of the system and so now we have this company that is born out of an idea that was poking fun at capitalism and it's now just part of that structure and and that exists across different realms i mean capitalists will consume and and financialize every single thing that they can find including critiques of capitalism and it's kind of ingenious when you think about it but it's also poisoning people's reasoning and their ability to sort of conceive of alternatives so i think it's important for us to go through the thought exercises of thinking about what different structures parts of society things in our lives would look like without that capitalist structure driving it forward. And it's it's got some potential for things to be different or even potentially a downgrade. Not everything is the same. You can't necessarily upgrade everything at the same time when you try to fix an economic system because there are reasons that the economic system is able to produce certain things and some of them are, you know, really terrible for the people who experience them. And so when you reform a system like capitalism to make it more fair, to treat human beings fairly, to not use people, to not use slave labor, all of those horrible things that go on today, every, every day across the world, if you change that, if you reduce the amount of harm that's being done to the planet, there are going to be costs in certain places. But I don't think that as a game, Warhammer has to be something that goes away if Games Workshop isn't in the picture. And I don't think it would be, and I think there's plenty of evidence for that. So with that, we're going to attempt to transcend our capitalist realist programming for the next little while and engage in the act of considering the world without Games Workshop as we know it. Part 3. Workers of GW Unite so the first version of what I'm envisioning for Warhammer Without Capitalism is probably one of the most obvious uh, and least disruptive transitions that you could have around something like this. Uh, so that would be whether through uh, coercion or confiscation or purchase, the workers of Games Workshop taking possession of the company. Now, this is not actually a completely fanciful concept. There have been many examples of workers purchasing the company that they work for, uh, usually in smaller scale environments. 
This is one of Jeremy Corbyn's proposals when he was attempting to become prime minister. Uh, he wanted to create a fund for businesses, uh, employees to purchase the business from their owners. Personally, I think that, you know, <laughs> purchasing isn't really necessary. Uh, labor is what creates all of the uh, products that businesses sell and workers should just be able to take over. Imagining this, Games Workshop, the corporation, changes hands and its stakeholders become the actual workers. Now, this is, uh, you know, it's something that exists largely in small organizations in the United States, but there are actually large scale co-ops out there that are owned by the workers and they are involved in the decision making process. Now that can have varying levels of input. It can be as simple as electing people to serve in the upper levels of management. It can involve consensus-based decision-making around policy changes, which becomes almost impossible when the company gets over like a few dozen people. Uh, consensus just is, is very difficult to achieve um, on sort of mundane day-to-day -day details. So you kind of need a management class within your workforce to handle that and with a company as large as games workshop obviously you need sort of a centralized direction for some of the stuff like each game needs to have a lead who you know knows what's going to happen next who is planning out what will happen with the game and all of that this way we would still have the company games workshop they would still make products we would still get the products from the company um assuming that we're still existing in some sort of a market-based system we would give them money they would distribute the money amongst the workers uh, and there wouldn't be the sort of shareholder value extraction that we have now uh, this is actually a really cool system uh, workers feel much more empowered and uh, happier when they actually have a say and an input in their work um, and management is not in an adversarial relationship with their employees and the the company doesn't kind of uh, have to try to make the most amount of money possible. Uh, that's not what's essential. Uh, their responsibility is to do what is what their workers want, and that could be to maximize value. And that you know isn't necessarily going to fix some of the problems with the way Games Workshop does business. And indeed a lot of leftists are critical of the idea of worker co-ops in some sort of sort of market or participating in capitalism or in a market socialism kind of context uh but i think that anytime you are sort of taking power from the shareholder class who own but don't contribute to the business uh and giving it to the workers it's a substantial improvement even if it doesn't fix things it doesn't get us to communism it's not the end stage it's not even you know it's it's not even necessarily sort of a full socialism until you sort of change the broader economic structure um, but it is a major improvement and it's something that would be you know past that sort of capital ownership concept uh, now i will link here to uh, a video uh, that will explain why there are major limits to market market socialism or uh, market co-ops or, or whatever what have you. Um, but but as someone who is skeptical of too much centralized authority and the tendency for that to result in a sort of uh, stopping of the revolutionary process and and a solidifying of a, a centralized elite, um, I do like the idea of a more organic transformation uh, where instead of having a, you know, a, the government buys games workshop and then dictates what their releases look like. That's, I don't think uh, nearly as, um, as liberating and, and uh, creative as the, the workers themselves being in charge of this stuff. So that's how my perspective on that goes. Um, I'll link here to a video about the Mondragon Corporation uh, from, the Laura <laughs> from the Laura Flanders show, as I think that it's a important lesson that can be learned about 
the potential for uh, alternatives to our capitalist structure that are very viable, as Mondragon represents uh, the 10th largest corporation in uh, all of Spain. And this isn't to say that this is some idealistic, perfect entity. It engages in normal capitalist activities, and that does lead to some exploitation. And I don't want to sugarcoat that or be dishonest about it. The fact is that this is a better structure than what we have right now, and it changes the power dynamics away from centralized power in the hands of capital. And that is the most important thing to getting past this moment of wealth accumulation. Because without the ability to accumulate massive amounts of money from ownership of shares, we would not have this billionaire class. But I digress back on to the topic of alternative ways for Warhammer to exist. Part 4. Death to the Fool's Copyright The next possible route we could go in terms of Warhammer without Games Workshop or Warhammer without Games Workshop as a capitalist entity is through changes in intellectual property law. So there have been a number of proposals over the years to uh, fix the insane system that we currently have where it's really wild but your ip it lasts your entire lifetime plus 70 years which is literally just a way for corporations and big financial entities to take ownership of things because people have died uh, and then hold on to them and monopolize them for decades and in my opinion this is a major factor in why we have such stagnant media now uh, because these companies, they don't have to worry about, you know, losing ownership over these properties. They can keep milking them over and over and over and over and over. And yeah, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. It, it's whatever. But if they didn't have a monopoly over these properties, then they would have a much stronger incentive to be looking for new properties, to be looking for creative new things, things that they could, one, monopolize and own, and two, that they could develop and compete with all of the sort of knockoffs that come with something becoming public domain. I think there are a lot of people who get sort of... They get their, their hairs up a little bit when you start talking about reforming IP and, and taking away ownership of, of people's intellectual property um, because for a lot of creatives, your intellectual property is sort of how you pay your bills. And, and personally, uh, I understand that and I don't want to take people's ability to make money off of their creations away. I think a, a, a set up like a 20 year sunset where you've got a copyright and then eventually it ends 20 years is an arbitrary number but i really like it particularly in the context of i saw a proposal and again let me get right up here um that would take away copyright after 20 years for non-commercial products that means that you could use it as long as it wasn't something that is being you know in the marketplace to compete with the original creator so if it's a character, for example, you could make fan films about them, you could make fan art about them, you could, you know, use them in a game, but you can't sell the game. And I think that that's a really cool idea because I think that it sort of reserves the, the original creator's ability to sort of control it. And then hopefully that would sunset in a reasonable amount of time. The proposal I linked to had 100 years before it could be used commercially. I think that's still way too long. I feel like 40 years maybe is reasonable. But I really don't think that there, there should be these century-long intellectual properties. It drives me crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, so it's one of those things where uh, I think that there's a sort of stagnation that happens right now under the current system, um, and I think that it would be really cool if we had the option to, to sort of change that. Um, so that's one thing to consider, that potentially we could change intellectual property law. And in that situation, Games Workshop would lose control of, like, Warhammer itself, uh, Warhammer 40k, all the stuff that's sort of decades old, that, that would become public domain for non-commercial use. And 
what's cool about that is the company would still be able to continue making new characters, new settings, new battles, new all that stuff. And those things would be theirs for a period of 20 years. So it would sort of create the situation where the stuff that was originally created, we have the opportunity to exploit it for our own non-commercial needs while they are still able to keep making their business. And they everything they create is sort of creates this tale. And so they just have to keep, keep innovating and creating new things. And then they can stay in business. You know, I mean, this is not necessarily a, a post-capitalist situation as i'm currently describing it uh, this is the the closest to sort of the current capitalist system just with copyright reform um, but the reason that it would be warhammer without games workshop is that by those things becoming public domain we would be able to sort of take control over them and do with them as we please uh, now there's actually some sort of living examples of that today uh which is that there are a, a few games workshop publications that, that got sort of handed over to the fan base to maintain uh, the most famous of which is epic uh there is a net epic is a version of epic that has been continually developed play tested and run by the epic community for decades ever since the game lost support uh this is a really fantastic system uh you can buy models from a bunch of different companies in order to play it you can 3d print models in order to play it and it's a wonderful game and it has held up so well over time and people are you know just really uh gung-ho about it people who are involved in it and i think that that's great because it represents uh you know this sort of lack of direct need for games workshop to be involved for a game to stick around people in the mordheim and the necromunda communities know this well too because living rule books that were maintained by the fan base have been a staple of those games up until games workshop rebooted necromunda um we don't need games workshop to play the games that they've made uh we can maintain them ourselves uh, the models that are easy enough to make um, with you know either other people's products or, or with uh, 3d prints and, and all of that stuff uh, so this is kind of a cool thing that you know this stuff is kind of hung around um, I do think that people are um, less likely to engage with a game that's sort of maintained by a community like that but I think that that's due to some sort of preconceived biases I would argue that net epic is better play tested better written and better thought out than any of GW's current books uh, and that's because there's been a lot of eyes on it and they have been gradually improving it over a long period of time and it has like everything that you currently have in 40k I mean they've been developing new units and new rules for as long as I've even you know been aware of it and I think that that's something that people should think about more, uh, which is that we don't have to necessarily keep up with Games Workshop's churn. We can play a game and play it our way and have it maintained by the community. Uh, but unfortunately, I do have a feeling that if you try to do that with 40k proper or Age of Sigmar, Games Workshop would send you some you know nasty legal letters because those games are much more important to them and in their control than these sort of specialist games that they handed off to the community to maintain. Part 5. Illegalism. The next way we can look at Games Workshop without capitalism, without games... The next way we can look at Warhammer without Games Workshop is the topic of illegalism. Now, I know that I've talked about legalism a little bit on my Andor video. Hmm. Uh, but I am fascinated by this concept because it's a bunch of people who were very passionate leftists who maybe were using that a little bit to justify some of their more criminal instincts. Um, I think that there's something very kind of uniquely human about that, this sort of a desire to justify and, and morally kind of uh, reify your your choices um even if they're you know sort of not really producing the revolutionary effects that you are going for so in the case of illegalism this uh is a movement during the 1800s among certain anarchists who wanted to 
create revolutionary conditions through crime. And some even justified the idea that all crime is inherently revolutionary because it violates the structure of the modern bourgeois state. Um, and, and of course, that didn't really go anywhere. It didn't get them anything. Uh, a lot of them wound up dead because that's what happens when you become a serial criminal in the 19th century. Uh, and so I think it's fascinating, but like elements of this movement sort of continue on to this day. Um, people talk a lot about shoplifting as, as a kind of praxis. And, and this is a form of illegalism. Um, if you're stealing, if you're committing crimes and it's part of your praxis, it is technically a little bit of legalism, not necessarily full legalism. Um, but the illegalist approach to games workshop is of course to download, uh, scanned versions of the rule books, uh, to buy recast or 3d printed or 3d print your models to buy recasts or 3d print your models, uh, to play outside of the games workshop stores and environment and sort of engage in this, you know, this world of, of Warhammer, uh, without doing it on games workshops terms. Now, like I said, this one already exists. People are doing this all over the place. From what I've heard, half the Horus Heresy players in Australia are using mostly recast models because they're so expensive. Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. And I think that that's a sort of natural human response to being priced out of something. It's people find a way to engage with it, whether it's theft, whether it's piracy, whether it's all this other stuff. And, you know, I personally can't really approve of recasting. It seems real shitty to take someone else's art that they created, uh, make a copy of it and then sell it. Uh, that's, that's just a garbage move. Uh, I, I can't, I can't get down with that. Uh, but you know, I, I do understand why people, uh, look for, you know, PDFs of the rules or whatnot, even, even just from the perspective of games workshop now only sells, uh, physical copies of books. And like, I don't want a physical book collection. I want my books to be accessible in a device where I don't have to carry them around. So to me, it's like, you know, the, the downloading PDFs would be the only way that I would consider playing Warhammer. Uh, but of, of course, as you know, I don't play Warhammer 40k anymore. Uh, I only play Necromunda and all the Necromunda books are joyously available as ebooks. So I have purchased them there. Uh, now there is some merit to this. Um, I think that it, the more people who are sort of uh, engaging in this, the more of an effect it has. But I don't think it will ever be a significant number. And uh, I do think that it creates some frictions at times. So that was the biggest problem with illegalism, in fact, was that it didn't win people over. If anything, it kind of made them ugged out by the anarchists. They looked at these people committing these crimes and thought, I don't know if I want to be associated with that movement. So that's a big downside of the sort of piracy route for Warhammer is that overall a lot of people are not going to embrace that because it violates their basic moral precepts. And that's okay. It's not their responsibility to, to sort of have the flexible morality needed to do this. Um, and personally, I, I, you know, I, I can't get into that because I would much rather have plastic models than, than resin, even even if it's an option, you know, to at much cheaper price. Uh, give me plastic any day. So personally, I can't really get in with it, but I do understand it. Part six, rise of open source. Now, last of our options that I have conceived of here is something that is able to exist within capitalism, but I do think is a form of radical praxis and that is the creation of open source alternatives uh, this is something that you would know from the software world um, but there exists this sort of whole realm of, of open source software development where people contribute to these projects knowing that anyone can use them uh, and do so because they're passionate about it and while there are, you know, lots of people who just want to consume and, and sort of work within existing systems. Um, there are a ton of fans of these games that actually do care about 
creating quality content and are passionate about it and don't necessarily need it to be a for-profit project. Um, personally, I do a lot of homebrew stuff and I don't look to get paid for any of that uh, because for me, it's a, it's a passion thing. I really want people to be able to uh, expand their options in the game table. I want them to have fun campaigns. So the idea here is something that I've kicked around for a while. And it's something that I think is a worthwhile pursuit. If anyone else is interested, uh, you know, it's something that I would be willing to dedicate time to. I think what we need is an open source alternative to Warhammer. Now, I know people are going to talk about one page rules. Personally, I don't consider one page rules to be a replacement for Warhammer 40k. Uh, one page rules is a fast, simplified game. And Warhammer has never been fast, it's never been simple, and it shouldn't be either of those things. So people love one-page rules. Personally, I'm not a fan. I'm glad people like it. I'm glad it's out there and glad that people enjoy it and play with it. But there are a lot of us who play these games because they want that depth and complexity. There's a lot more people playing Warhammer 9th Edition, a much more complex game, than there are playing one-page rules. And that's because those people want to engage with this big weighty system they don't want to play a game that's essentially you know a bunch of different flavors of the same kind of army playing against each other and that's okay chess exists too people really like that game uh but personally i want something that has that that cinematic feel that warhammer has always had at least to some extent or another that i feel like one page rules just completely abandoned uh in favor of creating a game that is balanced and i i don't care about that part of it you know balance is something that we should be dealing with separately uh the game should be as complex as the system that we're sort of comparing it to so i think that developing an open source alternative is a really cool idea because it would give an option for people to play that would be up that would be completely open for them to use and modify as they want you could literally take the documents from it and you could take the templates from it and you could write your own uh supplement for it uh you could write your own game essentially from it using it um you could take it and use it for whatever system you want and then that's sort of similar in some ways to to how warhammer and Warhammer 40k were originally it was sort of the same core DNA in both that was sort of forked and used in different ways. So what's interesting about this is that you could take as many mechanics from the Warhammer 40k system as you want because mechanics can't be copyrighted. They can't be owned. Game mechanics are just an open idea that anyone can use. So you could take a lot of the stuff that you like drop the things you don't like, tweak, adjust, and come up with a better system. And if you have a sufficient team, you could even do it on the scale of Warhammer 40k. I mean, there's you know, open source software that's far, far more complicated than anything Games Workshop develops rules-wise. And then for models, there's so much stuff out there now that you know you could play with any minis you wanted, just the same way that OPR does for for their systems. You know, the miniature agnostic gaming is, I think, a really cool idea. Um, I do think that there is a certain uh, aesthetic sensibility that Warhammer has that people get very precious about, um, and I think that definitely there is uh, still a case for you know, Games Workshop sticking around in that situation and producing games. Part 7. Conclusions So that's four different ways I can conceive of Warhammer continuing without Games Workshop. Uh, I do think that there's probably countless other potential scenarios that would, you know, work at just as well. Uh, you know, something like a Mantic, uh, you know, eating up their market share and making very similar games is something that could totally happen. And there would be Warhammer without Games Workshop, but it wouldn't be necessarily as sort of uh, as a, much of a difference. You know, you would just be trading one corporate master for another and uh, no corporation is going to you know, willingly leave money on the table. It's not how they're designed. Uh, so... 
I think that, you know, there are obviously other things that could turn into a benefit corporation, which is a very, very uh, ill-defined kind of nebulous concept uh, that I'm not even sure exists in the UK, but it exists here. And it's just not, you know, it's one of those like capitalist reforms where we're like, we're making business better, but only marginally and, uh, you know, don't ask too many questions. Uh, so I didn't go into any of that kind of stuff because I don't really think like reform minded concepts are really uh, effective. I think that, you know, we uh, so the I did get into one reform, which is the intellectual property reform. That's something I think that would be revolutionary uh, just to, to open that up. Um, and it would incentivize people to do non-commercial projects of all kinds. And that's really cool because non-commercial art is actually really awesome. Uh, you know, having to kind of, uh, pay the bills, um, with, with, you know, your, your project, uh, affects it. It changes what you make and having the option to do kind of art, you know, that, that is purely for the passion and love of it is you know, I think it's a great starting point. Um, so I do think that that idea is really cool, even though it is very much a reform that could exist completely within this existing capitalist structure. It would literally just be sort of rolling back copyright to being closer to what it was for most of the United States history and most of the history of copyright itself. Uh, so, you know, uh, overall, I think that it's important to consider that there are alternatives I think there's a case for de developing alternatives in the here and now, you know, there is this uh, sort of sense of why wait for a revolution when you can help make it happen. And uh, I think that if, if more people were willing to kind of embrace a, an open source approach, uh, that we could create an alternative that has the same level of uh, depth and care put into it as, as 40k, uh, certainly, you know, uh, net epic demonstrates that it's possible so with that uh thanks everyone for watching of course everybody you know uh, if you have complaints about uh about the the degree of politics in this uh you know you feel free to leave a comment about it uh if you have thoughts on on kind of what you would like to see out of uh an open source alternative to warhammer uh i'd love to hear your thoughts thanks to carl casey at white bat audio for the show's music and thanks as always to the show's patrons. You guys make this entire thing possible. And of course, uh, you can become a patron for as little as $2 a month by hopping over to patreon.com slash dome runners. And the show has a podcast, the dome runners, which you can get at buzzsprout everybody out there, please stay safe and don't forget to change your paint water. <laughs>